If I got up real early, mom was asked. This is my mom, by the way, Colleen Fur, Brother Dan Mitchell. She doesn't always get to travel with me, but it was, they worked out for her today. And um, uh, she was asking me on the way what time you got up this morning. And I uh, told her it was a little before 6. Probably I woke up about 5.30 and laid there for a few minutes and get up early enough to be sure to prepare and pray for the service today. And so at 5.30 in the morning, it's pitch black. I mean, you know, that, that's the way that works this, this time of the year. I love this time of the year, the beauty, beauty of it and all that side, but I don't like the fact that it gets dark uh, so early and dark so late. But uh, our house, we live up in McCordsville. It's on the east side of of, of Indianapolis, and um, we have our our bedroom windows facing the north, and there's a big tree there, and so when it starts, it's pitch black in our room. I mean, there is no light, and I'm in there this morning, and I'm walking around in the dark. Have you ever done this fumbling through the dark because you're trying not to wake up your, your spouse? You're trying to be kind to her, you know, and sensitive to that and all, and so I'm bumbling through the dark, and I've done this many times before, never had this happen, but this morning I stumped my toe, and how many know that that is not pleasant <laughs> and i i wanted to scream and i and i wanted to turn the light on because i wasn't finished and so i went over a little bit later and i'm still trying to be kind sensitive to her and i get into the dresser drawers and i'm pulling out my socks in the pitch black and i pull out a pair of socks to wear and i'll go to shut it back quietly and i smashed my finger in the closet drawer bank double whammy and i'm thinking what in the world and immediately the lord gave me a thought you know what you're sacrificing for the benefit of someone else you love and that's what missions is all about that's what this is all about why should we give to people we don't know because we love them we want them to hear about jesus i heard one missionary say some time ago the reason some people don't love the lost is because they don't love Jesus. And when you learn to love Jesus, then you'll learn to love people that haven't heard and don't know. And that's why we're here, and that's what missions is all about. Um, as he said, I had the opportunity. i, I got to tell you a quick story before I get into my message this morning. But I was in Minnesota this past week for a North Central University uh, board meeting, and our daughter's there. It's a, our, one of our Assembly of God schools. It's way up in Minneapolis, right downtown. And um, we heard a missionary there, spoken chapel by the name of Jim uh, Hartwig. And he is one of our Assembly of God missionaries in Indonesia. I uh, had, had remembered but had forgotten the story he told 2004, the Indonesian uh, tsunami. Because remember the video of that, the uh, gigantic tidal wave that came in. Um, he said, and I didn't realize this, but they said still to this date, the largest human tragedy, human disaster in world history, 240,000 people, their life were snuffed out in just a few moments' time. And um, he talked about that experience because he was there. Um, they actually had several missionaries that had met in Sumatra, Indonesia, just days before that happened that came down. Um, all the other missionaries had left. They were there for strategizing uh, 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 strategizing for how to reach that area because it was lost, such a uh, severely lost uh, region of the world and region of Indonesia. And uh, the other missionaries had left. He had stayed behind because of uh, some sickness that he had had. And he was the only uh, missionary left when that tsunami hit. And just hours after, you might remember the uh, John F. Kennedy aircraft carrier was there and the medical team and the Navy were there. And uh, one of them, one of the officers came across uh, with a gym and they discovered that he spoke the native lang Indonesian language. And they looked at him and says, you're now working for the Navy. <laughs> and they used him to minister to uh, hundreds and thousands of people in the days and weeks that uh, followed that. But um, this is what he said, though, that really struck my heart, and I hope it will get you. I want you to listen to this. He said that with that Indonesian tsunami hit, 240,000 people's lives, a quarter of a million people basically were snuffed out like that. He said not one single Christian and not one single church was hurt and damaged or lost. Now, before you get too excited about that, let me tell you why he said the reason why. It's because there wasn't a church and there wasn't a Christian there. There's not any. I want you to think about that for a moment. Three and a half billion people on planet Earth have yet to have an adequate presentation of the gospel message. Indonesian is, is a lost nation. It's a Muslim community. There are no churches. I don't know if they've planted and established anything since then. I hope they have. But at the time, 2004, there was... Uh, 
a region of people that had never had an adequate presentation of the gospel. And friends, I'm telling you this morning, that's why we present Speed of Light. That's why we do BGMC. And that's why when we stand before God, he's not going to ask how good we looked on Sunday morning or how good we sang in the choir or worship team. He's going to ask us what we did with his final command to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to the lost and dying. That's, what, that's the final uh, mother of all final exams when we stand before God. That's what it's going to be, going to be about. So, so today, I just say that to say we don't apologize for uh, having speed the light and BGMC emphasis. Amen. How many guys plan to go to heaven? Hello? I think, I think that's all of us. <laughs> Maybe a couple of you want to go the other place. I don't know. <laughs> Want to go to heaven. The truth of the matter is, though, I don't know if you thought about this before, but you won't be in heaven two minutes until you'll be looking up Pastor Dan and saying high-fiving him for every missions dollar he ever inspired you to give. When you get to heaven, you won't be kicking yourself, man, I wish I'd saved some more money to buy that boat. I wish I'd have saved my more money to buy that new set of golf clubs. Oh, I wish I'd have bought, saved money to build that, on that addition on our house. Why in the world? You know, for ten thousands upon years, you're not going to be going. You're going to be saying, why didn't I do more? So, we don't apologize for this emphasis. If you're a visitor guest today, I want to tell you, you came one of the best Sundays of the year because you're having missions emphasis, and there's nothing better that we can do Nothing better that we can do uh, with, with our finances and our investment. Jesus said to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal. For where your treasures there will your heart be also. And I can't imagine a better place to invest, certainly not in stock markets, not in gold or silver, it's not anything else because that stuff can be gone to the tsunami just like that. <laughs> but we can invest in heaven. And that's, uh, God says, uh, it's greater that we do. And uh, so I want to challenge you today. You know, speed the light in case for you're brand new to this. I just give you a definition. It's the youth initiated strategy of the assemblies of God that raises funds for transportation, communication, equipment needs for sound systems, for trucks and cars and Jeeps. It's even purchased a couple of camels in the Middle East. If you can imagine that, that's where their mode of transportation. But it, it purchases equipment that's directly related with getting the gospel out, provides for our missionaries. I get missionary letters and emails by virtue of the job description I have. I get them uh, on a regular basis. Say, Pastor Steve, please continue to tell our churches how vital the speed the light uh, money and dollars are to us to stay on a foreign field. And I've had missionaries literally write to me and say, Brother Steve, we could stay on the field and wear the same clothes, live in a mud hut, eat pork and beans, and worn out tennis shoes. We could stay on the field and, and tell people about Jesus, but we can't do this without the sound system, without the vehicles and transportation to get the job done. can't be done. And uh, somebody came up with this figures number said basically 90% of what missionaries do in regard to evangelism requires speed of light equipment. BGMC is a little bit broader because it provides equipment uh, for, for missionaries. It's not uh, uh, communication and equipment needs, but other uh, more miscellaneous needs. But none, nonetheless, they're powerful, powerful strategies. And I want to tell you what, the needs that we have Right now, as a district, we've got close to $200,000, $250,000 worth of projects on our plate. That's just speed the light alone. But it, it can't, those dollars can't be raised just by kids that don't have jobs. <laughs> so that's why we need churches like this that have a vision and why God puts that heart, uh, a vision in the heart of a pastor like Brother Daniel to, to do this and, and, and make the difference. We, we set a goal. We're going to show you a video here at the end that I believe is going to touch your heart. Because there's a revival going on in the Middle East where we are providing, through Global University, Speed the Light dollars, providing Kindles and iPads for pastors from these uh, churches, Muslim churches uh, converted to Christianity uh, there in the Middle East. And, and it, it, the church is exploding. Even in the midst of per great persecution, the church is exploding. This video will show you that in just a little bit. But I saw that video about uh, uh, 10 or 11 months ago, and it stirred my heart. And the Lord spoke to my heart about setting uh, this $1 million goal, and we've never come close to raising a $1 million in Indiana in a year's time. Now, they did it in Minnesota a couple of times, back-to-back -back years, but uh, that kind of stirred me a little bit, too. I said, well, if they can do it. <laughs> 
But then the Lord, I saw that video, and the Lord really spoke into my heart that we need to stretch our students and our youth across Indiana and believe for something big. And uh, I'm so pumped and excited because this weekend at our youth convention, we're going to be recognizing close to 1,000 students that between last year and this have raised $100 or more <laughs> for, for Speed the Light. And I don't know if we're going to get our million-dollar goal, but I know we've got a lot of students and, and youth ministries that are doing far more than what they would have done otherwise. Um, we're going to have youth groups got 75 students. Brother Ken Grace up at LaPorte's going to have about 70 students, 70, 75, that have all the entire youth group has purchased uh, 1,000 shirts. And we're going to have some students up to give the testimonies. There's a young boy from uh, uh, New, New Palestine that uh, he's only 13 years old, and last uh, spring, he joined with a youth group where they were strategizing to do a thousand of different things to raise dollars uh, over a month. And so his strategy was he was going to solve Rubik's Cube. We got any Rubik's Cube solvers in here? <laughs> Not me. I tell you. Can you do it? Okay, well, maybe this is a good thing for you. Okay, so this kid, Eston Inskeep, solved Rubik's Cube a thousand times in just a few hours. He can do it in 20 seconds. <laughs> one time after another after another and he would challenge people watch me pledge to, to speed the light and he raised thirty five hundred dollars solving rubik's cube a thousand times both at the school and inside and outside the church and what's really cool about that story brother joy Inskeep told me just text me just the other day and says you know what eston's not done there he raised all that last spring he said he's back at it again because he's on his soccer team at his junior high school there in New Pal, and he, he went to his coach the other day, and he said, Coach, can I kick a 1,000 soccer balls to raise money for missions? And he said, well, sure. He said, well, can I ask my friends to do it too? And he said, well, sure. And lo and behold, now he's got the entire soccer team, both boys and girls, saved and unsaved, church and unchurched, kicking soccer balls <laughs> to raise money for missions. I believe that God's able to do wealth of the wicked, folks, is laid up for the righteous. And they're seeing some incredible things. And I go on and on other stories of students that have baked a thousand cookies and tips. Up to, I mean, I was at church last week down in Evansville where we recognized a young man that got up. And uh, he had a job at an ice cream shop. He's only 17 years old. And uh, this year he saved a thousand dollars in tips. I don't know what kind of ice cream shop you got to work at to get a thousand dollars in tips. But <laughs> apparently it's worked. And he's, and he's given that entire amount. For Speed the Light this year. And we're going to be recognizing some of those students at conventions. It's just exciting. And you know what? I, I can't think of anything that I'm, I want to say proud, that's not a word, but just more thrilled to be a part of uh, than challenging the next generation to do something big for God. Amen. And uh, I believe I believe in this and excited about it because the scripture that was referenced a, a little bit ago by our brother, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. But that scripture in Romans 10, it says, how can they call on him who they not believed? And how can they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? In church, that's the exciting part. BGMC and Speed the Light, that's what we do. That's what this does. It sends those that will go in our stead. We can be a part of that and make a difference in places like in Indonesia and all around the world in the Middle East. And as we say, we're going to see this video. I want you just to stand with me for a second. I want to read uh, the scripture, Judges chapter 2. Brother can pull that up. I want to read a, a text that the uh, Lord laid on my heart for today. A little bit of history here in just a minute, but uh, something will challenge you for, for where we are. I want to preface... It's by saying that, um, get up here a second. I'm a little on the short side. I want you to be able to see. <laughs> Just, uh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be taller, Brother Dan. As tall as you are, maybe. <laughs> um, I serve on the National Youth Cabinet D as a DYD. We rotate in and off of that for three years, and I'm getting ready to go off. But I've served on that during the time when we were, over the last year, been hammering out our, our new mission statement for what, we concluded we, we feel like nationally Assemblies of God Youth Ministries ought to be about. Who are we? What's our identity? Has ever wondered that? What, who, am, who am I and what am I doing and what's my identity? And I know that there's a lot of rabbit trails that the church can go down and good rabbit trails. I'm not saying that there's things that they shouldn't have emphasis. But when you get back to the main thing being the main thing, here's the three points that came out of our National Youth Cabinet 
for our mission statement are these three, that what the church of Jesus Christ needs to be and what the youth ministry needs to be and what the church needs to be. Number one, we need to be gospel-centered. Everybody say gospel-centered. Number two, spirit-empowered. And number three, personally responsible. That's what, first and foremost, who we are. To keep the main thing, the main thing is uh, we're gospel-centered. Everywhere we go, what we preach, what we teach, how we live, how we communicate, we've got to keep the gospel in front of people because we live in a day. You don't have to go to Indonesia to see people that don't know Jesus. You don't have to go to Indonesia to find out people that have never even heard an adequate presentation of the gospel. I just got my hair cut just a couple of weeks ago from a gal in Indianapolis that has black garb all over and she's in the great clips but she had tattoos and I got to con- conversing with her and come to find out she says uh, you, you know I'm getting married in a few days and I said well, wait, I'm getting married on Halloween and I said wow and I used that as an open door I said well look, whatever day you're gonna get married on I've never heard anybody get married on Halloween but if you're gonna do it in a church get a minister put Christ in your life and the church in your life to start your new marriage out and she said wow I don't know any ministers and I don't know any church because I've never been to church Never been to church. 19-year-old girl right there on the east side of Indianapolis. Folks, I'm saying we don't have to go a long ways to see people that don't know. She went on to say, you know what? Will you do my wedding? <laughs> so I'm, I may be getting to do a, a wedding here. You know, I, I just, I, I'm telling you, there's people there that have not heard, don't understand, haven't darkened the doors of churches. And so we need to be gospel-centered in what we're doing. And I want you to look at the scripture, Judges chapter 2. Um, very familiar story. Uh, backdrop to the story of the, the exodus of the children of Israel coming out of Israel. I'm reading the New International Version, um, verse 6. If you want to follow along here, I believe we got up on the screen. It says, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, that they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timoth Eries in this hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After that, whole generation, get, get this verse 10. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. The English Standard Version says, and there arose up, Another generation after them, this is after Joshua, who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Lord, I just pray to God you'd help us to hear the word of the Lord today, to understand, to comprehend, help us to be attentive. Lord, I pray not only, though, that we would be hearers of the word, but be doers also. Help us to be attentive, but also help us to be sensitive to what you're speaking in our hearts. Lord, I believe that there's someone here today that just maybe has been callous and insensitive and unhearing. Lord, today I pray you break through that. And Lord, that we would be willing to step out and, and, and to do, Lord, not just hear, but to do what the Spirit of the Lord is saying for us to do. And Lord, we'll give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. If I say, amen, amen. You can have a seat. <clears throat> I want you to use your imagination just for a minute. How many of you guys have good imaginations? I want you just to imagine that you were one of the Israelites that came out of Egypt, okay? Can we do that? Maybe you have to close your eyes, do that, but just go send yourself way, way back. This is back before GPS and before <laughs> computers, before cars and trucks and before electricity was discovered and all those things. And they're coming out of Egypt, the mighty ten plagues that took place. I don't know how many of you have seen the movies and you've seen the videos the Exodus and the Red Sea crossing. They come to the Red Sea and they cross over. Some Bible theologians and scholars tell us that the likely location where they crossed over the water of the Red Sea is as much as 200 feet deep, which would have made the walls of the Red Sea on either side as high as 15-story uh, skyscraper on either side, and they walk through on dry ground. And they're led by cloud by day and a fire by night, and they are fed manna from heaven miraculously every morning in the wilderness that just shows up they get water out of a rock when moses strikes 
the rock at Ephraim, you know, and that water came, and they're, they cross over Jordan's river miraculously, and they march around the walls of Jericho seven days, and on the seventh day, the walls tumble down. Some Bible scholars say as much as a 26-foot wide wall that just came crumbling down, and one miracle after another after another, and yet this may be the most shocking verse in the, uh, the whole Old Testament to me in verse 10 because it says that after all those things, if you can imagine, this is unfathomable to me, that a generation rose up after Joshua that did not know the Lord nor the works of the Lord that had been done. I can't comprehend how in the world it could be possible that they could have sat around the campfires night in and, night and year in and year out and not tell their kids about the great things that God had done. How can that be? I can't fathom how that you can't say, you know, to your grandchild, you should have been with us when the walls of Jericho fell. You should have been with us when we were going through the Red Sea. What about those plagues that God brought into Egypt? Yeah, and yet they didn't know the Lord or those works. And as shocking as unimaginable. And you know what? I, I have a harder time fathoming that than I can fathom that God stopped the sun in the sky and the miracles of the Old Testament. But that is an amazing, shocking truth that the scripture says that they didn't know the works of the lord but as unfathomable as that is church i want you to get this this morning is there something that's more fa- unfathomable and something more horrible is that we live in that same generation of time right now in the united states of america where we have generation of people that are, have risen up just in the last 40 50 years that do not know jesus and they don't know the works of the lord we got people atheism is such on the rise and not just atheism but th- those that do believe in god make up their rules and make up their god as they go how many know what I'm talking about. We live in that kind of an hour. We've got uh, an hour generation where young girls, 19, 20 years of old, never have darkened the doors of a church. We've got people that don't know the Lord or the works of the Lord, and we have a responsibility, a personal responsibility to, first of all, be gospel-centered in what we're doing as a church, church on the rock in Versailles, Indiana, be gospel-centered in all that we do. Can I hear an amen? Now, The second point that they brought up on that mission statement that I want to bring out is we also must be spirit-empowered. Everybody say spirit-empowered. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I want to stress to you this morning that the Lord never intended for the church to reach the lost without the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. He never intended us to be a witness and to evangelize and to be out there talking to our neighbors without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he told the disciples, it's imperative that I leave and go to heaven so the Holy Spirit can come and enable you. Stay ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And they were filled 120 in the upper room and they changed the world. <laughs> Scott Wilson that uh, just did our conference last week has written a book called Spread the Fire. And a couple of quotes he has here that I think are so powerful. He says um, in his book Spread the Fire, he says that the Lord has no intention of leaving us to reach and disciple people on our own strength. We go in the authority with the fire of the Spirit. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, he says we will overflow. It will overflow into the lives of others. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will reproduce that in the lives of others. Amen. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll fill the empty pews and the empty seats through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says that trying to evangelize and reach people without the power of the Holy Spirit is like trying to drive a vehicle down the road without gasoline in your tank. How many of you ever run out of gas? Well, it's not very much fun. My wife's done that, by the way, I think about three times, and I've never done it. Thank you very much. Which only goes to prove that I'm smarter than her, but don't tell, tell her. <laughs> But uh, it's, it's a terrible thing. You've got to get to the gas pump, and you've got to refill. And we need to be filled not only once, but we need to be refilled. Hello, amen. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to be moving forward and progressing down the road. And Scott Wilson also goes on to say, if we're not igniting people around us, could it be that we're not on fire ourselves? And he says, if we're not gladly and spontaneously telling others about the love of jesus then it's probably because there's little fire burning in our heart and our life we need the power of the holy spirit 
folks can I hear amen, amen to do what we're called to do. One of my favorite uh, Acts stories is in chapter 3 and 4. Peter John are on their way to uh, the temple at the hour of prayer. And it says they came across that man. I want you to use your imagination again to see this. This gentleman had been there crippled since birth, and he's crying out for help. And he, Peter comes and his eyes fasten on him and says, Hey, brother, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ I give to you, rise up and walk. And the scripture says a man jumped up on his feet and he praised. And uh, I can't jump very high this morning because I did some workout yesterday. And I felt, But he jumped, I believe he jumped a whole lot higher than what I just jumped. <laughs> To be the first time you ever able to get up and to run and to jump and shout and holler. And it says that a great commotion, a great crowd of people knows because they knew who this guy was. And it caused such a commotion that the Sanhedrin and the teachers of the law, they arrested Peter and John and they brought him in and interrogated them. And they were ready to throw them and lock up the key and put away the key. And they, they do it and they ask him that, these questions. And that scripture in chapter 4, and this is what really strikes a chord with me. It says that they look, they took note that these men all had PhDs and theologian seminary degrees in their Bible schools. Is that what it says? No. <laughs> it says they were unschooled and uneducated men, but they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Can I submit to you, church, this morning that all we've got to do to be impactful and impact and make a difference in our community and our neighborhood is spend time with Jesus and let people be able to take note. You've done that. You'll change the world. It's not by our might, our power, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We need to be a church that's Spirit-powered in order to understand the, the, part, the third part. And I want to spend the balance of our time on it. We're, we're personally responsible. Everybody say personally responsible. I believe that every true born-again believer is responsible to the Great Commission. Every true, authentic believer. Because it's not the Great Suggestion. Jesus' last words were not a suggestion. It was a command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. That was the command. It is a great commission. And I believe this morning that every true, authentic believer of Christ is personally responsible to love and to have vision and to sacrifice for the sake of those that are lost. That whole concept of sacrificing and brother dan referenced it this morning of, i don't know the, exactly the word he said i think he said give till it hurts or give till you felt it that's something that's really been on my heart in recent days and recent weeks i'll be frank with you i've preached a lot of speed the light services and bgmc services mostly speed the light because i haven't been doing kids as long but i've, I've preached a lot a lot of mission services over the years but just uh about a month, a month and a half or so ago, the Lord really struck this theme on my heart to present it to the churches. And we're going to do this when we show this video in a moment. Is what have you sacrificed for souls? And uh, I believe that we have a responsibility to love them. You know, the Bible says that the number one commandment, everything that we are to do in Christianity is summed up in these things, that we love God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and we love our neighbors, ourselves. And so we have a responsibility to love them. As I mentioned, I think that there are some, as one missionary put it, that don't love souls because they don't love Jesus. But if we love Jesus, it's going to be a natural. What would Jesus do? He would love, he's not willing that any should perish, amen, but that everyone should come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, another quote I saw from uh, one of my DYD peers, he says, we can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. We can give without loving, but you cannot truly love the lost and love souls, love Jesus without giving. And I think uh, someone else said that no matter what we do in our giving, the Lord God set the pattern for us in motion when he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that's what, what we do. Three and a half billion people that have yet to hear. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, this illustration of that number, but three and a half billion people is just a number that is just kind of out there. But if you want to put a, a visual, an image to that, 
think it's Brother Larry Stockstill's book, Surge, says if you were to take all of those people and you were to line them up shoulder to shoulder and stretch them out as far as that three and a half billion people would go, here's, here's the length of that line. It can start in Versailles, Indiana, and go across the United States to the Atlantic Ocean, across the ocean, all the way to Europe, across Asia, across the entire vast Pacific Ocean, come to the United States of America and go across the Rocky Mountains and the Plains and the Mississippi River, and the, the, the line continue on where the last person could shake hands with the first person that started that line. But that's not it, three and a half billion. That's only the start. If they're standing shoulder to shoulder, and you stretch that line out, it would not go around the world just once. Not just five times or ten times, not just 20, not just 30, not just 35, but 37 to 38 times around the globe. People right now alive that have never had an adequate presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Much like that 240,000 people that were snuffed out in a moment time in Indonesia. And so the Lord's not willing that any should perish. And we've got to understand that there's a, there's a vast harvest that we need to realize there's more to life and our responsibility than just paying our mortgage and just getting our child on the soccer team and just raising funds for them to, to go to school or just to, to, to buy a new fishing pole or golf club. Or, you know, there's so much more to our, what's our responsibility. We'll have account to to God. I heard a missionary just a couple of weeks ago and I want to share this and I want to show this video this morning. But uh, Mark uh, Renfro, who is part of Live Dead uh, Missionary Strategy in the Middle East. Um, Mark Renfro has lived for 30 years um, supplying and planting and uh, churches putting missionaries in place there. He's over the Middle East Live Dead, Dead Project along with Dick Brogdon. But... Uh, Mark Renfro comes from the state of uh, Nebraska, I believe, but he grew up, left his three kids. They all left to, to go there, and they've been there, this is it, for like 30 years. But uh, he said he, he described what the difference is between l being lost and unreached. And I've never heard this before in this way, but there is a difference between just being lost away from the Lord and being unreached. And he explained, identified it this way, and, and I want you to track, everybody take a deep breath because I want you to get this this morning as well. <laughs> But to be lost, he said, be kind of like a family from Indiana that were taking a summer vacation, a year of vacation, and they go to Florida to a, a hotel with a swimming pool, and they've got their two little kids out in the pool, and they're swimming, and lo and behold, by, by, by chance, the, the little three-year-old son gets separated, and eyes lose contact with the parents for a bit, and he goes into the deep end of the water, and he's drowning in the pool. And what are the odds that that child's going to be saved it's still probably very good because that mom, that dad are there, and there's other people around the pool watching. Somebody's going to dive in and save that little child that's floating away in that swimming pool that doesn't know how to swim. So that's what being lost is kind of a lot like. But he said to be unreached is kind of like that same family of four that live in Syria, the Syrian community, and they're trying to get out of their nation, not to go on vacation, but just to save their families, save their lives. And he said that they will connect and is happening. By the way, he mentioned this is a, one of the greatest human tragedy disasters in, in, in world history, what's going on in, in Syria and the people that are being, being killed and lives devastated. But he shared that they, by the masses they're finding, the black market, those uh, boat captains, that old Chevy boats that they put them on, it's supposed to hold 20 people. And he says, like, that family will get on that. It houses 40 people instead of 20, and they're going not... Uh, on a on a uh, a moon filled night when the waters are calm, but they will go when waters are choppy, trying to get across the Mediterranean Sea to Europe for a safe place. And they try to go during time where they'll not be seen and caught by authorities. And they get out in the middle, and the waters are are uh, shaky. And imagine the same three year old child were to fall over, the mother were to fall over in the middle of the ocean. What are the odds that that child would be saved? These group of people on that boat that don't know how to swim, growing up in a desert. And this is a story that plays out and act happens in reality again and again and again. So the chances of that little child, that mom being saved, are basically zero. And therein lies the difference between being an unreached nation and just being lost. In church today, I want to tell you, there's, there are many unreached nations that we need to pray, Lord God, give me a burden 
Give me insight, Lord. Give me uh, a heart that cares. Help me, Lord Jesus, to have a heart that as you have, have, Lord, that is not willing that any should perish. And, Lord, that drives me to make that a purpose and not just a, a seasonal campaign but a lifelong endeavor that we have a, a, a passion and a burden, dear God, to make a difference. I'll never forget one little guy that came up to me at a Speed of Light rally several years ago. He had tears coming down at the end of the altar time, tears coming down his face, and he looked and he said, I want to say thank you, Pastor Steve, for <coughs> coming tonight. It was Tom Green, was speaker that night. Thank you for the time for coming. And he said, well, he said thank you for giving me a reason to live. <laughs> and, you know, that says so much. And church, Again, I want you to think about this as we get ready to show this video this morning is what have I done, what have I given that I really felt, that I really missed? See, it's it's really easy to just tip the Lord. 10%, 15%, 18% of our meal, you know, I, I can get away with it. It's easy to do that, but the widow, Jesus said, I'm going to tell this story everywhere. This woman has given more than all the rest because she gave everything she had. She gave, gave a sacrificial offering. And the whole idea in sacrifice and giving and giving till it's felt, till it's hurt. I want to preface this, what you're about to see, by, by telling you that there's incredible levels of persecution that's going on amongst Christians around the world. We are spared from that here. How many of you have ever been beaten with rods because you were a Christian? Anybody in this room been thrown in prison because you were a Christian? Anybody or you know a family member that's been put to death because we don't have, we don't experience, and yet those things are happening in truckloads of nations around the world. The Middle East right now, to be a Christian is a death sentence unless the grace of God that saves you and spares you. And yet, in the middle of that, what you see here in this is there's a revival that's going on in the Arab world among Muslims that is, that is amazing. In the last, since 2014, coming up on four years now, in this one nation alone, what we're, we're going to see, they have grown the church. The churches there have grown from a few dozen to now over 6,000 Pentecostal spirit-filled churches in one Muslim nation alone. One nation alone. <laughs> And they're called upper room churches. And it so excites me because they're not these churches that are just nominal and just kind of show up for 90 minutes once a week or once a month. And that's all the investment and sacrifice. But they're given their lives and martyrdom and imprisonment and everything and all the above in many cases in order to be a part of the church. Some cases meeting in mosques <laughs> because it's actually to a degree it's easier to hide that than meet in a house. You have a house gathering and it's highs are perking up and they know the things that are going on but these five requirements for the upper room church i want you to get this and let's see number one is they've got to be a born-again believer jesus christ number two they've got to be filled with the baptism of the holy spirit <laughs> isn't that great it's not just you know that's the biblical pattern the lord didn't give these scriptures and acts just as a suggestion either he told us to tarry and be filled with the holy ghost so these upper room churches are saved number one number two baptized in the holy spirit number three baptized in water it's required in order to be a member but Dan, we don't do that here in america we allow people to become members when they walk through the door and they just show up three sundays you know we allow them to be members but there they've got to be baptized in water they got to be baptized in the holy ghost number four they have to share their faith with a family member and that's where the rubber meets the road because there in the Muslim community, when you share with a family member, that's where, that, that, that's where endangerment and tr catastrophe takes place and a lot of imprisonments, a lot of martyrdoms. And number five, they have to be a part of a compassion ministry in their community. And uh, Global University has come up with a phenomenal strategy in the last four years. Speed the Light is purchasing the iPads and the Kindles to give to those pastors. See, those pastors over there, I need a big Bible just for a second, Brother Dan. I thought, I have my Bible on my iPad. It just doesn't have the same effect. So. <laughs> but those pastors, those upper room churches, they can't walk down the streets of their community with the Bible under their hand like this without going to jail or being put to death. But you know what they can do? Anybody got an iPad in here? <laughs> I'll let this uh, suffice for now. They can walk with one of these that will have the entire scripture uh, 
downloaded onto their iPad resources for pastoral training and Pentecostal resources and teaching for discipleship. They can have that and carry that. That's being provided by Global University and Speed the Light. And it is so exciting. <laughs> Everybody say exciting. <laughs> Because these churches are exploding. You know, the Bible talks about that the church grows faster in the, in the height of persecution than it does out, outside of it. And that's what we're seeing there. Um, so we're raising dollars. And I want to tell you, the cool part about it is for every 90 to to $110, which is where these shirts come into play, we not only get a shirt, but we are purchasing one of the iPads that goes to one of those pastors. Heavenly Father, I pray today. I pray today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that because of your son, Jesus, he, he set the example, the, 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 the only perfect sacrifice there ever was. Lord, that we, it says in your word, Father God, that we were bought with the precious blood of Christ. Not with silver, not with gold, not with anything that will tarnish, but with the precious blood of Jesus priceless father god if you were willing to give up the priceless son of god for sinners lord god then lord take everything i have lord let my life be spent in service to you lord god holy spirit i pray today that you would just empower us and i thank you lord god that we would be personally responsible Lord, I thank you that we would not pass the buck. Lord, we may not go to a foreign country. We may not fix meals for the homeless in downtown Cincinnati. But Lord, each one of us has a mission, has a place, has a purpose, Father God. I thank you for our mission fields, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for Honda. I thank you, Lord God, for uh, every place. I thank you for the school, South Ripley, Jacksondale, Batesville, Milan, Father God. Rising Sun, Switzerland County, Father. I thank you, Lord, for every workplace, Father God, the hospitals, Lord God, the schools, the factories, Lord God, that we work in, Father. Lord, as we give sacrificially, Father, of our finances, Lord, to finance those missionaries that go to the... Uh, other places we can't go, Father God. Lord, let us also sacrifice ourselves, Father, in the places that we can go. I pray, Father, in your precious heavenly name of your Son, Jesus, I pray, Lord, that, uh, that, that the thought of the lost would be on our mind continually. Lord, I know it's on your mind because you're not willing that any should perish. Let us think like you. Let us speak like you. Let us act like you. Hallelujah. I give you the praise, Father, and I thank you, Lord, for all these things today. And Lord, I pray that as we leave here today, Father, Lord, that we would walk out of here spirit-empowered. I pray that this day will not, that the sun won't set today, Father, without an opportunity, Father, a divine appointment for us to be the light and spread the gospel. As we go home, as we go out to restaurants, wherever we go for lunch today, Lord, I thank you for divine appointments. May we hear testimonies, Lord God, of your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.